Hi, sir. Welcome to the news. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for having me. So I know in your line of work, you've often also found yourself on the back end of some of the situations that lead to impunity against journalists. So I'll ask your opinion as we start this conversation. How do you think the lack of impunity for crimes against journalists uh, continue to impact press freedom and democracy? I think the most glaring um, impact is that it just creates an environment of fear for journalists. So lack of impunity means there's no consequence for actions for whatever kind of crimes against journalists, fiscal or non-fiscal. And so it just makes journalists, you know, genuinely just afraid to do their jobs. And that just automatically spirals into something else, preventing press freedoms, because journalists cannot do their jobs, report, um, you know, free speech just because they're worried of what's going to happen to them. So I think that's the most glaring impact. So what are some effective measures that you think can be taken to hold accountable those who commit these crimes against journalists, who make it difficult for us to do our jobs? Um, first things first, I think the most obvious thing is, and it's something that we've continuously said, is for governments and institutions and people to continuously allow and promote freedom of expression um, and press freedom. It seems basic, but it's something that we have been grappling with for decades, right? So it's as simple as encouraging like advocacy around the freedom of rights and expressions for journalists. It's as simple as continuously retreating it through whatever medium and possible. Also as simple as governments and institutions supporting organizations whose job it is to uphold press freedom. Um, on the aspect of consequence, it could also be that, for example, law enforcement um, actually taking following the law to punish people who perpetuate crimes, especially fiscal crimes against journalists. Because one thing we've noticed is that there's often a lack of consequence. And because there's a lack of consequence, there's no deterrence for people who might want to do it again. So if the law is upheld and people are actually punished for harming journalists, then people are going to think twice when next they want to do something like that. I would also say that Another thing is in terms of like passing out information to people is when people think about like crimes against journalists, they often think like the violent crimes only, like fiscally harming journalists. But it could be as simple as creating a campaign against misinformation, because one thing people do often, especially online and with digital journalism now, is that they spread misinformation against journalists in order to like you know tarnish their credibility which is also a crime against the journalists so we need to make it very clear that things like that even if they're not physical are also harming journalists and we need to go on like a full-blown um, campaign about like how this is also a problem for journalists yeah so how do we bridge this dichotomy where in a situation it's government that meant to uh, keep journalists safe and even prosecute people if necessary if they threaten journalists in their line of duty but oftentimes we find that it's government at various levels be it federal government or even uh, federal states or even local levels that are sometimes uh, those who are guilty of these very crimes they're meant to uh, stand in the way of what do we do in that situation who do the journalists turn to that is the big question that journalists have been trying to answer for a very long time we still um, don't have the perfect answer we can just continuously repeat the things that we've been repeating like the government should allow journalists to have um, freedom of speech one thing that i would say is that there needs to be more pressure on governments to be more open and accountable, especially governments that own uh, media organizations, so publicly funded government institutions. One of the things that we can do is continue to apply pressure to make them more open about their processes. It could be as simple as government um, funded ads, which we know are often partial, something like making it more open and clear so that it's like this is a government funded institution. Institution. This is a government-funded ad. This is not. Um, this is not about independent journalism. Those kind of things put pressure on the government and make them more open and accountable. There's also the thing of looking to um, international communities outside one's own um, government for accountability. You cannot ask your own government who is oppressing you to be accountable. They're not going to do that. But when there's pressure from outside sources, like we often see in some cases in Africa, um, I think a good example is when I, I suppose it's it was the Algerian gov. Um, the Algerian head of state, when he shut down the internet, when it happened in Sudan, Sudan as well, there was like outside pressure from people like consistently talking about it and sort of holding their necks for accountability. So sometimes it's a, it might be as tricky as leaning to other people outside like your government for like that kind of pressure. But to be honest, it's the million dollar question that we're all still trying to answer until today. And that pressure typically in this day and age comes with social media. So what do you think we can use or how do you think we can use social media when it comes to uh, making sure that these crimes against journalists, these crimes of impunity against journalists are either completely eradicated or reduced to the barest minimum? Do you really think that people do react 
uh, companies or governments as it may be react to social media shaming? Most definitely they do. It's not usually the best form of shaming. The best form is usually going through law enforcement. But we know from experience that that also has its limitations. So social media most definitely is a great way to, one, put pressure on governments, but to also make people more aware of what's happening um, in other countries. We have been... Uh, when, I mean, the war in Sudan is still ongoing, but like we know that one of the ways that we were even aware of what was happening was because of social media. We had the information and then we could then raise funds for the people in Sudan to help them out. So it's those little things like where social media has a role to play in these things, even during like elections, because you can be fiscally targeted if you try to, for example, report the news on the ground. You could go the social media route. It's not foolproof, but like it helps. So I think it is a slow burn process just to answer your question. Yes, social media can help for accountability but this is a long game and in all honesty the biggest thing that would help us is with governments and institutions allowing press freedom it is a long long battle that we just have to continuously fight for all right Aisha before I let you go we're both female journalists having worked in Nigeria for a number of years do you think we also need to make this a gendered conversation should there be a, a gendered lens or at least a gendered aspect through which we look at media practitioner safety particularly for uh, women journalists on the front lines be it whatever sector or sphere of the work they find themselves most definitely like the you cannot talk about this without talking about gender because women's experiences are vastly different from men's experiences women are more prone to harassment sexual violence in comparison to their male counterparts that is what the data says and so when having these conversations we also have to look at a separate angle for like protecting women especially from the gendered lens in in all honesty it's still um a simple long game and one of the things that we can do for the you know for the women angle is one create like sort of groups and institutions where women come together and share their stories, offer protections for each other, but also the continuous advocacy that I say about gender reporting. It's, it could be as simple as teaching people how gender reporting can be different from regular reporting. It is still a, oh my goodness, long battle, um, and women are much more prone to harassment, but it's one of those things, like I say, continuous advocacy, and continuous, this is where law enforcement also comes in, because I know, for example, in Nigeria, that there are gender desk who, gender desk who often, like, look into things like this, especially when it comes to women, so that needs to be tightened as well, but again, honestly, the takeaway is, it is a continuous long game that we have to keep going for and playing. All right, thank you so much, Aisha Saldin, for joining me. We'll be seeing you soon. Thank you for having me. Bye.